You've got McAvaney, Cometti and Roberts. And then you've got these two. Nuffies. Living in denial. It's Croft and Horto. Welcome to the Fat Side Podcast. Footy was defiant, but ultimately it was all in vain. As Gill closed the door on the game yesterday, as we brace ourselves for some bloody tough months ahead. Welcome to the Fat Side Podcast. Horto with you. Croft in the studio as well. Hello. Mate, uh, it's a bit glum today. Very. Very glum. I, um, have, I have coronavirus. Oh, please don't say that. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very serious thing, Mr. It is, it is. It is very serious. I've, I thought yesterday at one point that I was like, I think, I'm like, I think I've got a fever. No. I, was, I was like sweating it up. No. I was like, oh, I, think, I think I might need to go to the doctor. And then I was like, oh, I did drink a few beers yesterday and I just had a curry for lunch and I maybe I'm just sweating. So you were just hungover. over. I'm hoping that was the case. You were I just feel, hung over. I feel like I'm just. I feel like I'm the kind of guy that I'd get it. I feel like I'm the kind of person who have to call around all my mates who I've like seen the last like two weeks and gone, just so you know, I I've got it. Well, you don't want to get. I it. I don't want to get it. I, that'd be awful. I hope not. But I just feel like I'm just the kind of person who misfortunate things happen to. I feel I, I, like I feel like I'm just that kind of guy. A lot. I live right near the hospital where where all the quarantine is, so it would make sense. Nah. I do, I, I'm at a loss, really, yeah. to kind of explain what's happened over the last two to three days. Yeah. Uh, the weekend, especially, there were updates constantly, constantly, just in my feed. I, I should probably get off certain news sources at yes. the moment. I'm probably a little bit too obsessed with this topic. Yeah. But last night, for me, really hit home. When footy gets cancelled, the PM comes out, he addresses the country, I was just sitting there and I was like, this is like when people were cradled around TVs in the US and in Australia and wherever in the Western world, watching updates about Vietnam and things like that. And I was like... Or the moon landing. We're, yeah, but we're in, we're in a ser- serious crisis at the moment. Mm. It's really sad. And, and the only thing I could think of last night was just how inconsequential footy is. Of course, we're going to go on and talk some footy and hopefully it'll brighten up people's lives and their days. But... I was just sitting there going, geez, footy doesn't really matter that much, does it? There's something so much bigger at play. And the NRL aren't getting the memo. <laughs> they are absolute morons. No. They're, I hope their supporters are embarrassed yeah. by the way that they're leading the game. But let's not let's not hark on about that too much. But yeah. I was just sitting there last night going, oh, shit, bars are closing, restaurants are closing. And my brain was just going, how many of my mates are going to lose their jobs? A lot. A lot of people are going to lose their jobs and a lot of people in football are sadly going to lose their jobs. Be ready to see clubs uh, cutting staff, you know, media teams, extra trainers, casual staff, part-timers, you know, the kids who do the video down at training and post on social media, they're all, they're all getting sacked. They're all losing their jobs. They're all getting told, well, if we come back in a couple of months, then maybe we'll rehire you. But there's a lot of people at the, you know, in footy, not just the people we think about. We all think about players and coaches and the media, you know, personalities. But it runs way deeper than that. And there's a lot of people in the game uh, who, yeah, probably don't have a job today. And to all those dickheads at Bondi, God, that was shameful. Mm. The international press was smashing mm. the people that were down at Bondi Beach. What do you expect, mate? Uh, Sydney, uh, Eastern suburbs, Sydney Swan supporters. So that's what you get. Absolute idiots. Um, so we'll just we'll touch on this, although. We must preface it as well. We have a wonderful interview coming up. Fantastic interview. With Tom Boyd, uh, who came into the studio and I... Boyd's kicked a goal! Yep. Boyd's kicked a goal! What an impressive young man he is. He is. He's only 24. He's so well-spoken. Very well-spoken. So he, he unfortunately, Tom himself, has, has lost all his speaking gigs because mm. they've been cancelled. And he came in and he was, he was wonderful. He was. He's such a bright spark, su- uh, such a articulate kid yeah and the way that he spoke to mental health was uber uber impressive yeah um great kid can't wait to show you that chat a little bit later yes definitely stick around uh gil mclaughlin so footy's been suspended until may 31 yeah definitely if you didn't know i feel like if you're watching this you're probably well aware yep um and this is what he can't this is the defining statement yeah to say this is the most serious threat to our game in 100 years is an understatement it is unprecedented in its impact. So basically what you said before, Croft, this is going to have a trickle-on effect. Mm. A lot of people are going to lose their jobs. A lot of these clubs are going to lose significant money 
as yeah. a result. Um, and we're going into the great unknown. We, mm. we really don't know exactly what's going to transpire, how the AFL are thinking about contingencies at the moment. One thing I will say, the May 31 date to me is completely arbitrary right now. Because, again, we don't know how many coronavirus cases we're going to have in Australia in the coming months. Mm. I just can't see a world where we're playing any more footy for the rest of this year, maybe looking at July, August. But again, no one's got the crystal ball. No one knows how this is going to play out. But for me personally, Croft, I think that May 31 date is going to get pushed out and pushed out and pushed out. I just don't think we're going to see footy. Uh, yeah. I, and, and it's not that important. It's not a big deal. It's just footy. No, I love footy. We're talking yeah, about I, I love footy too. <laughs> and it's great to speak about footy. Yeah. And it's great to speak to these old players, ex-players, coaches, administrators. And that's what we'll do on this podcast. And we'll try mm. to forge on as much as we can. This is going to affect us as well. But footy, you know what? Footy's just not that important. It's not an essential service. Um, and that's the reality of the situation right now. And do you know what? It begs a question. It really begs a question. I'm going to put you on the spot. What's the question? Well, it's an obvious one. Were we right to go ahead with round one? Did Gil McLaughlin and his colleagues make the right call? Um, well, look, they wouldn't have made that call if they did. Like, it, would, it wasn't a hasty decision. There's a reason to talk until the day before the game for them to actually confirm that it was going to happen. They would have spoken to lots of medical experts, uh, all the right people. They, you know, they made their choice. But he said it from the beginning. He said this situation can change within hours, within days, and it has. That's that's what happened. You know, we were all surprised that it went ahead, but we said to ourselves and, you know, you and I had conversations and other friends of mine had conversations and we are like, gee, I don't think this is going to last long. And I guess the AFL are hoping, they're like, hopefully we can get a couple of games in before it gets worse, but it's gotten worse way sooner than expected. But hopefully it gets better than when we are forecasting it. And like I said, May 31 is the date. Who knows? We could get to May 31 and, yeah, maybe we are looking like we're coming out the other side of it. But maybe we're still in the thick of it. Um, we don't know. You touched on... It wasn't a good look, though. It was not a good look. What, play, players walking around on the field, touching each other, sharing water bottles? Like, it was, a, it was a terrible look. I was embarrassed by the AFL over the weekend. I didn't enjoy... I, I, I hardly enjoyed it, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, it was weird. I mean, it was weird because you're watching footy with no crowd and there's no atmosphere. Yeah, but hang, hang on. What about the social distancing measures and all those things? Well, obviously, the, the thing, when they step onto that line, they're not going to be doing that. Like, but the, but it, it, it takes it... it take, like, you're not social distancing. You're playing a game of AFL football. That was the decision they made to do. They obviously made sure everyone was, you know, washed and cleaned and had sanitizer on before, before the game because every one of those players who went out there would have been check to make sure no one is actually sick. You know, they, this isn't, there wasn't a willy nilly decision. Like, no, 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 no. It looked personally, it looked deplorable. It was such a bad look when you've got government trying to enforce rules mm. and guidelines yeah. and then no one's sticking to them. And then, Ka and then Scott Morrison comes out last night and slams all those people for not um, complying with social distancing orders. It wasn't a good look, Rob. That's all I'm saying. I just think for the sake of the game, Round one not going ahead would have made more sense because there were so many people over the weekend that were slamming the AFL for the poor look that it was. Mm. And I, that's exactly what I thought it was. And it just felt it felt glum. There was a, a distinct void in the way that it was played. I don't know. It just – I didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy it from a lot of respects. Yeah, it was weird. I mean, it wasn't normal football and – you know, in hindsight, yeah, maybe it wasn't the right decision. I mean, that, like I said, it wasn't something they did lightly. Um, but, you know, who knows? We're probably not going to see the rest of the season. And all I know is that Essendon is going to remain undefeated for 2020. <laughs> and that's uh, I'm happy with that. I'm, I'm cool with that. I'm great knowing that we've had an undefeated season. We can move on until next year. You'll take it. Uh, I've just got a, a, a photo here, Croft. A graphic. So let, let's lighten it up a bit. There was some footy and there were a, a, a few little things that I did enjoy. And Mr. Tom Papley, he's a bit of a joker. Skinhead. There's a, there's a lot of energy when it comes to uh, Tom pa Papley. A lot of energy. He's fast. He is fast and he's a great player. Uh, he kicked a ripping goal against Adelaide. And then he ran to the boundary line and he put his hand out. <laughs> to no one there. He, he put his hand out. Mm. To the imaginary people on the boundary line. I yeah. thought, I I was, thought wait, it was I, good. I was waiting for someone to jump a fence and do the old, like, clap your own goal but celebration. No, did it? No. Because Michael Walters did that, didn't that's, he? A, that's a soccer thing, though, to behave like that. We don't celebrate as hard in the AFL. You, saw, Ma do. you saw Michael Walters doing that as a gag? 
Um, I've seen Michael Walters take a few dives, but I didn't see that. So. No, no, no. So yeah. they were at training and he, he, and he been. Oh, one. no. So the one at training, I did see that. Yeah. I think he meant during the game. I was like, pretty sure he didn't do that. <laughs> like, no, did, no, that didn't no, happen. No, you would have watched that game. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Tom Papley, bit of fun there. Didn't mm. mind that one. Um, just a few points over the weekend. We won't go into too much detail, but... Jack Martin looked really good. I think Carlton fans can be very excited about him when yeah. we play the game again. It was a steal, absolute steal to get him for nothing. Essentially, there was a little, there was a little moment there where it looked like he might have slipped through the cracks and the Gold Coast were going to retain him, but uh, they basically got him for nothing and kicked a few goals in a game where, I mean, it was like a few games on the weekend where if we actually played a full match, it could have been some very different results. Carlton came home with a, you know. Bit of wind in their sails, and maybe they could have stolen stolen the game. I feel like Richmond just took their foot off the gas, though. Yeah, I think if it was a normal game, yeah. maybe they would have surged on a little bit more. But mm. Carlton were okay. But Jack Martin looked awesome. Collingwood, they took the pi double s out of the doggies. Yeah, did someone forget to tell the Bulldogs that we were actually were playing round one? Because it seemed like a lot of them weren't aware. They were awful. Um, <laughs> if we do see more football this season, one point is this. If you can't contest Brody Grundy, doesn't you have to beat him? But if you can't make him accountable, you're not going to win. Yeah. Like he was like Team English is a young and aspiring ruckman, but it was men against boy. It was like watching one of those freakish kids who's six foot five. Men against 15. boy or man against boy? Either. When he's, <laughs> it's Fair. it's like when you see one of those junior footy games or basketball games where there's like that kid who's six foot six and he's 15 years old and then he's squaring up on the kid who's like five foot five. That's how it felt. Grundy was just all over the place. Every time I turned, I was paying attention to that game. I was like, oh, Grundy's got it. Oh, he's got it again. Oh, he's marked in the goal square. Oh, yeah, cool. Hit out. Yep, sweet. Like yeah. nothing. If you can't go head to head with him and at least make him competitive, it's going to be near impossible to beat Collingwood. The Browns were good, by the way. They were good. The young boys. Do like a bit of brother brother action. It was nice. Yeah. Okay. That's weird. Uh, the the Dons and uh, <laughs> the Dons and Freo. It was a Friday. It was a fairly average game. Yeah, it was two <laughs> very average teams. It was. I think. I mean, this is me speaking as a one-eyed Essen fan, but I feel like if we actually had a key forward playing, Fife was one-eyed. Fife was one-eyed. Ha ha ha. I feel like if we. SS and had a key forward playing, whether it was one or two, it, I think we probably would have pushed out a fair bit further because there was a passage there through the second and early third quarter where realistically we should have put them, we should have been 40 points up. But when you're kicking to a forward line with no one over like 192 centimetres, it's going to be hard. Like True. when you're playing Townsend, who was awesome, by the way, this has been a great pickup for Essendon. When you're playing him as your full forward, and then after one game. After one game. So great pick up after one game. Well, he won us the game. So, yes. So, who's undefeated? We are. Are you undefeated? No. Oh, so There's no season, Rob. We're undefeated. That's futile. Undefeated. Uh, futile. So, yeah. Uh, he was. He's a good pick up. Great to see him playing full forward. But I feel like if Essen had a bit more going on there, um, I'd sad to say I think Michael Hurley's not going to be playing AFL for many more years. His, his body's stuffed. Yeah. He's absolutely cool. He got taught a lesson by a young kid. He he, he said it in the one-on-one with Damien Barrett at the start of the year that he's like, yeah, I haven't got long left. My body's falling apart. You and could he, tell. You could tell. He, mm. couldn't, he couldn't hit packs. He could barely contest. He got basically pushed over by a young little kid. So He did. Uh, Tex Walker missed a crucial shot in their game against Sydney. And if he kicked that, he would have won it for Rory in his 200th. So disappointing for Tex. Don't you feel sorry for Tex? Yeah, I do. He actually played a pretty good game, to be honest. I was um, taking the piss. Everyone right. was sort of writing, writing texts off, saying that he's, you know, pass it. Why is he so hated? I don't know. He's pretty hated. Yeah, I think it's just because it's, it's, he's from Adelaide. I think Victorians like to hate South it's Australia. the way he walks around. Yeah, it's all, it's all in the power stance. Oh, I, I, massive ears. I, I, I watched that game, and I was, me and my friends who were sitting on the couch, We I was like, he will he would slot this. Like, I backed him in for that kick, and I really thought he was going to kick it, but he, but he didn't. He likes – he's funny. He's like a he's like a Matthew Richardson. He likes them from outside 50 rather than, you know, 25, in 30 close. out. Yeah. Straight in front. But he didn't get it, so it doesn't he matter. Didn't bin it. Uh, Chad Wingard, I just have to make mention of him. He was absolutely immense. I think he had seven score involvements, 20 touches, three goals. Yeah. Very egg, good. Egg on my face. I thought the Lions would win this one comfortably. Yeah, oh, I know. Yeah. Look at that. Oh, well. Made me change my tip. Oh, well. How's that? My brother last night, he's more worried about the fact that he got his tip wrong because he changed his tip last minute to the Ds. And I was like... Well, that's a terrible decision. No, but it, n- not only is it a terrible decision, it's terrible to get upset about the fact that you're worried about tipping in this current world, this society that we're in. 
Like the first thing you could think of was, <sighs> oh, I lost my tip. I don't know, man. Oh, no. Footy tipping's pretty important. God, Scott Horton. Uh, ben Cunnington was unbelievable against the Saints as well. Won the game for them. Yeah. Uh, that was a very similar game to Eston Freo, but in this scenario, St Kilda were the ones who let it go. They had a great lead, really should have won the game, and yeah. then um, North came home big in, big in the last quarter, and that was the end of it. They just couldn't hold on. And how's me saying that Ben Brown and Nick Larky weren't going to play? And they were, and they won. So, Yeah, absolutely silly. This is where you get the best insights of this show. <laughs> Absolutely the best insight like, Who are these idiots uh, I just have to bring this one up And it doesn't kill me to bring it up I don't mind Because I, I love this player But Nick Nat slaughtered Gorney He was very very good Very very good <laughs> Yeah I mean is Gorney fit Like, Don't think I, so I don't like we're, I mean I was surprised that he was playing Gorney didn't To look, be honest He looked a bit proppy old Gorney yeah. But in saying that He was out there He got selected And he got absolutely belted by old Nick Nat Nick yeah. Nat that, That's the thing about Nick Nat if you even if even if you get a, I don't know two thirds out of him for a season, mm. he's so impactful. You forget about how bloody good this player is. He's very impressive. Uh, but I just want to bring up Cozzy Pickett. He was super super exciting. Kick two two should have been probably three. Do you reckon he won? Hit the post. Didn't reckon he won per no. se. But um, he's some. He, he's a player that the Melbourne supporters can get very excited. Did you about. see when they um went to the crowd and then oh, the, the crowd they went to the stand they went to the stand and um byron was sitting there yeah loved it yeah i was i was after straight away got the phone out youtube highlights byron pickett wrecking blokes did, did you hear what the commentators were saying no i wasn't listening they were like oh my god it's byron they were like trembling just oh. because he was in the vicinity guys byron's here oh my god byron's 200 meters away go back Watch Byron Pickett's hit on Rhett Biglands in the showdown. I know. Oh. They showed it. Did they? They showed it. <laughs> <laughs> they showed, they, 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 it is brutal. They showed three or four of his biggest bumps. It's crazy to think, like, if someone did that today, we would be like, this is outrageous. What a despicable lack by this footballer. Ten years ago, we're like, how much of a lord was Byron Pickett? He still is. He's still a lord. Yeah. <laughs> but you do that now, oh, you're a dog. I love that his nephew plays for the Melbourne Football Club. Yeah, he's super exciting. I was watching. I was watching like an old interview where Port Adelaide. I think it was it was him and I think I can't remember who it was him and another player from that era of Port, and they were interviewing him and they showed him that hit, mm. and they're like, "Yeah, so Byron said, why'd you do it?" And he was like, "Well, I was trying to get the footy, and he was in my way, <laughs> so I hit him." And it's just like <laughs> perfect. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, no, that'd be, well, he's right. That's that's good attitude to have. It's very logical, Byron. Yeah, I love it. No, it's good. Um, Big on him. Now, over the weekend, there were Yanks, Americans, going absolutely bonkers for AFL footy because there's no other live sport going on in the world. The AFL decided to forge on. They got one round in, but it gave new rise to another market that I guess the AFL haven't properly tapped into. And it's America because America are in lockdown at the moment. The world's in lockdown. All right. And there are a few uh, YouTubers that were watching that were tweeting that were absolutely losing their minds. Couldn't believe how cool the game of Aussie rules football was. One in particular is Pat McAfee. Is it McAfee? McAfee. I don't know. McAfee? McAfee like McDonald's? I don't know. Pat McDonald's. Let's just call him that. A shout out to Pat. So he's an NFL YouTuber, Rob. And... um, he loved it so much. He even did a little bit of this, uh, or like a little report analysis, a breakdown of how much he loved it on his YouTube channel. Let's have a look AFL, at it. NFL, the Australian Football League, Aussie Rules Football. I watched my first game last night at like 1 a.m., and it might be my favorite sport I've ever seen in my entire life. Basically, Aussie Rules Football is the best thing that could have <laughs> ever been made. They punt like six times a minute. There's they, punt they passes. There's completions. Yep. There's running. Completions. There's tackling. Refs toss balls like 65 yards over their heads. Refs. There's like, it's just this awesome sport that I knew nothing about. It's played on like a three-mile surface area of grass. <laughs> it's yep. the biggest playing surface I've ever seen. There's 18 players, I guess, per team. I think there's 18 refs, too. They run around doing the thing. It's just you're trying to score by kicking it between these two bigger poles. That's worth six points. And if you miss Correct, that yep. and put it in between these two smaller poles, which are on either side of that, that's worth one point. And then there's just right. a yeah. bunch of shit going on in between. I mean, it that's is. True. It's electric. Like I'm going to be honest. Byron it Pickett is electric. Blokes. They might run four miles a game, though. It, that, that could be the only thing yeah, it's a bit more that than makes that. me think I wasn't built to play that sport. The four-mile, five-mile, maybe even ten-mile yeah. a game thing. 
Is there still tackling involved? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're oh, doing yeah. Big yeah. hits. And they're doing the jump up on other people's backs to catch uh, kick passes. I mean, it's just. I was up until like 2.33 in the morning, and then I started Where researching, and then I woke up this Where morning, and uh, I got a bunch of Australians telling me they appreciated my tweets last night. So oh, thanks, I'm, I'm hot in the Aussie Rules football world right now because I am hot on to the Aussie Rules football game. Anyway. Yeah. Wow. Good on you, Pat. Cheers, mate. Appreciate that. Cheers, Cobber. Yeah, cheers, Gov. Cheers, Coco. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. that's great stuff, though. Oh, it's great. It's, I'm glad they're uh, enjoying it. Yeah, from what I was gathering. He's a big deal, by the way. Okay, cool. He's so, got, me I, too. Um, so, <laughs> oh, my God. So from what I was, from what I was gathering is that uh, Fox Sports 1 over there, which would normally be playing basketball or NFL or baseball or whatever, mm-hmm. because there's nothing on, they decided to bring AFL out of, you know, the, the, one of the, the small little sports channels that no one used to, used to, to prime time and all these uh all these yanks who were up late night just went what's this game and they were blessed blessed to watch the Essen football club versus Fremantle I mean if you're ever going to expose our game to the world I reckon that was the game to show them it's beautiful that they had no idea <laughs> about the context of those two teams yeah but straight away he said he he I read one of his tweets and he went I really like this guy number 25 for Essendon Jake Stringer and yeah. I'm like yep yeah, he's on it. He's like, can I get? He's a on. He's on Paco. He Love wants. It. He wants to get a stringer T-shirt. Yeah, done. What did he say? A long sleeve. Yeah. Well, Pat, I will. I will send you. A, I will send you a personal tea from our merch store that we're going to open soon. I'll personally send you a tea, mate. You can have one. I'll buy it. Yeah, that's a good call. Yeah, let's send it over to him. Um, let's get to Tom Boyd. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Let's do it. Brilliant chat, Tom Boyd. After the break. Croft, great start. Good last start. week yep. with uh, Mr. Mike Sheehan, but uh, really looking forward to speaking to this guy because mm-hmm. there's a beautiful little segue here. Mm-hmm. Mike, of course, saying that his greatest grand final of all time, the one mm. he enjoyed the most, yep. was the Western Bulldogs against Sydney in 2016. So we just thought we'd uh, we'd call up a big dog. We'll call up a big dog. From that grand final. And I teased it at the end of the last episode that we might have him in. You did? Because we thought about it. Are you going to play it I'll and, play, and I'll, embarrass him? I'll play the clip and embarrass him. Boys kick the goal! Boys kick the goal! That is very embarrassing. <laughs> anyway, Tom Boyd, former GWS and, of course, Premiership player with the Bulldogs, joins us in the studio. Welcome to the Fat Side. Thanks for having me, guys. Mike must speak nicely about me because we lived in the same street for the last couple of years. So really? Oh. Yeah, Albert Park neighbours. Okay. Oh. So you're like a teacher's pet of Mike's. More like I was the guy avoiding hitting Mike on his bike, riding around <laughs> like a lunatic in Albert <laughs> Park all these years. You told me a funny thing upstairs. Um and I, I, I may as well just put it out there. Glenn mm. Nanton was here and you're doing a podcast together, which is great. And you're trying to create some content while people bunker down. Um, and a lot of it stems from, you know, talking about stories and getting things off your chest and mental health and all of that stuff that is super important to our society, probably more than ever before. But um, you said <laughs> upstairs, you're like, I was born in 95. And you're like, the first meeting you had with Glenn Nanton, you had no idea who he was. <laughs> Yeah, thankfully, or maybe not thankfully. Uh, funnily enough, I was walking around this cafe in Footscray where we were meeting, and he must have been 10 minutes late or something. I almost sat down next to three different people thinking it was Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is going to be a serious meeting, so he'll Poor be in a suit or he'll yeah. be stressed up. And I was like, this guy looked at me, he's like, no, no, that's nah, not me. That'd be. And finally, this bloke walks in in a white T-shirt with like holes in it and mm-hmm. yellow <laughs> Lakers shorts. That's Glenn. And I'm like, covered in tattoos. And I obviously never Googled him, never knew exactly what he looked like. Why um, didn't you Google him? I don't like to do it. I think it impacts on my like first impressions. Having said that, it would have been nice to know what he looked like so I could at least sort of <laughs> seek him out middle of the um, the cafe. But uh, he's a terrific guy, amazingly intellectual. Mm. Um, don't judge a book by its cover. It's an ultimate lesson for Glenn's life, I think. Yeah, yeah no. And he's he's always like, and he's always late. Yeah, he's always late. <laughs> we've, is, we've done some work with him as well, and he's always late. Yeah, which is totally fine because he's a pretty like laid back individual. Yeah, you know, so there's no issues there, Rob. Yeah. don't throw him under the bus. Too no, much. I won't. Wait till he's on the pod. So, what's going on? What's happening in life at the moment, Tom? What are you what up are to? You, what are you doing? Oh, probably like everyone else, absolutely nothing right now. Um, <laughs> Just talking to us, idiots. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I was filling in the Friday afternoon um, on the pod. Um, <laughs> look, I think the last eight months has been extraordinarily um, enjoyable for me. I've come out of the game of AFL, 23 years old, starting a new career. Um, really got engaged in the public speaking space, doing a lot of work in mental health and, and well being sort of started doing my uni again at, at Vic Uni, business and um, management and innovation. 
same time, started up playing footy at St. Kevin's. And then as of 10 days ago, mm. work's gone, yeah. <laughs> uni's gone, and, um, and footy's gone as well. So, look, we're all trying to find time in our lives to achieve things with all this um, drama and uncertainty that's going on. And one of the ways that I can do it is probably get a little bit more on the tech side of things so I can mm. still continue to push my message, which is ex- extraordinarily important at this um, certain time that we find ourselves in. Is public speaking the long-term goal? Is that what you want to stay into or is it just something that you're enjoying doing at the moment? Good question. We sort of, um, I think in life we sort of fall into things to a degree. Mm. Um, Look, I knew that I wanted to make an impact in the mental health space. Um, It was a really, really big focus for me personally in my career. And likewise, once I'd been through it, I was happy to share it. Um, I thought it was extremely useful for people to hear someone talk about it, particularly someone in the public eye. Um, but then when I finished, I sort of wasn't destined to really just dive straight into it. But people wanted to hear my story. Yep. And quite quickly, I found that um, I was reasonably good at it. Um, I was committed to it and I wanted to learn to get better and, and enhance my speaking capability. So I think long term, um, I think it will always be part of my story. Uh, whether that's my whole story or my whole job, who knows? Yep. Who knows? Um, and that's the exciting part, I think, at the moment. Yeah, cool. You're very young, though. Mm. And that's a great point you make. <laughs> There's a long way to go on your journey as well so for the moment the speaking circuit i applaud you for doing it it takes a lot of courage there probably are no better people to speak to than mr glenn manton himself yeah when it comes to speaking because he's a a superb exponent of it and he does some great work with uh children the disadvantaged youth um when you when you made the decision to retire from from footy was it a relief? Was it a release for you? Did you did you feel at ease with the decision? Was there a huge burden off your shoulders or was it a little bit bittersweet? Um, I think there was a few layers of emotion. Um, clearly walking away from, um, you know, a really promising career or, you know, in the eyes of the public at, at the age of 23, it seems a ridiculous thing to do to retire from AFL footy. Yeah. Yet by the time I got to the end of that, um, that, that period of my life, I was so certain that I had more value outside of the game of AFL. Uh, now that's not to say that retirement didn't come without its challenges. I certainly had a few weeks there where, much like the moment uh, at the moment, where there was just not that much that was graspable. There mm. wasn't that much routine that I could create. Um, and as much as AFL players grow up very quickly, some aspects of your life you don't grow up at all mm. because you've literally lived with someone else's routine and yeah. someone else putting you into place for the you know f- you know the rememberable part of my life. So. I had to learn a lot really quickly. I'd learn how to sell myself. I had to learn how to um, show how I could be of value to others. Um, and I also had to learn exactly what I wanted to do, um, which was a great transitional period. Whilst challenging, it was really, really important for me to go through. Lovely words. I enjoyed that. Um, I just want to bring you up on a, a feature article or a piece that was done, I think, 18 months ago um, on the Age website. I was just reading it this morning and I've been across your story because I have a story as well. Uh, I had mental health issues uh, from about 19 till about 22 and I still have an anxiety disorder and I have to run and do all these certain things that make me feel good. Um, and I loved it's – really, it's a really simple message um, and I'll even quote it. You said, when I'm not feeling great, it's about let's go and do something enjoyable. Let's take the dog for a walk, go surfing, whatever it may be, just to make yourself feel better. It's a really good message. It's a simple message but it's a really powerful one as well because – I've been mentoring a few close friends as well um, in the last six to seven years that have come to me and knew that I was fairly open about my problems as well. Um, And I I say a similar thing to them. I say, what makes you feel good? Listening to music, running, jogging, boxing, whatever you need to do, swimming, um, go out there and actively do it, um, particularly when you're feeling glum. So, that message, is that something that you're continuously spruiking, you know, on the speaking circuit and when you're talking to young people? Yeah, well, I commend you first and foremost for being so honest. It's such an important part of this journey we're on um, with our sort of society's understanding of mental health and the way we sort of come to grips with it. Look, I think, um, you know, my motivation to get myself out of a hole now is so strong based on the fact that I've been through some pretty, really pretty bad times, some really mm. terrible times, um, times where I wasn't sure exactly what was going to happen. And so I'm extremely motivated now when things aren't, well, aren't perfect that I can go out and do the things that I know will help at least mitigate that feeling um, or those feelings. Um, yet I'm, I understand that the, the decision is very simple, but the, the actual ability to execute the decision when you're feeling poor is very, very difficult for a lot of people. Yeah. And now it seems simple to go, oh, well, you're feeling bad, do something to make you feel good. But when people are in these darkest moments and feeling really hopeless and, and, and not themselves, it is so, so hard for you to tell them just to get out there and do something. But, yeah. but it is so important that they do. It's true. So 
um, you know, this is a journey that we're all going on um, personally. We're on the mental health continuum somewhere, whether we're feeling at our best or our worst. Um, there's always things that we can do and, and messages we can share with others that ultimately will help them get through some of their periods of time that are a bit more difficult. Yeah, it's very p- important that you are open and have those discussions with people. And you do speak to some people through walks of life and you talk about someone you know who might be going through some things and they, they don't really understand it. And I think until someone you're close to has gone through a bad way or yourself has gone through a bad way, you are you, know, you might seem distant from it. You might not really understand what's mm-hmm. going on. And, and it's quite easy for people to be qu- quite careless and go, oh, that person's feeling bad. Oh, well, they just need to try harder. They need to do, put in a bit more effort. But until you've really seen it, you don't, you can't, you can't, it's hard to understand. Is what I'm kind of saying. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, Very. It, it's had such a big impact on my life and I have an enormous respect on the power of it, both positively and negatively, mm. might I add. Um, but I think the thing for people to remember is that, you know, you never really know what someone else's life is like no. or what they're going through until you actually speak to them and ask them. And even then, they might not be completely open and honest. The message I tend to give to people is, uh, no matter who you are, and I'm a good example of that, you know, I, I probably had ticked every box of things you'd want to achieve by 21, mm. um, you know, million dollar a year player, AFL, just won a premiership, one of the best players in the day, did all the things and more that people could have dreamed of. Yeah. Yet I was really, really miserable. And every single year we lose play, uh, people from, you know, the most successful walks of life, whether that be entertainment, mm. or sport, business, whatever it is, based on the fact that they're not feeling like they're valuable within mm. themselves. So it's too too strong a subject to ignore. Um, and it, it is to our um, to a degree our responsibility to learn about this stuff. Put some time in. It's not hard. There are resources out there that are really trustworthy to learn about the symptoms, about how it affects people, and just generally what's out there so you can be better equipped to help the people around you. It's a lovely message. Uh, and I think you executed that perfectly. The thing I actually said to a friend a couple of weeks ago when we were out having a beer was, in my friendship group personally, I feel like in the last probably two, three years there's been a major shift. I feel like people are just happy to open up now. They're happy to talk about their problems. And it's it's really – it's a beautiful thing. Um, and it's something that I, I guess I in, in advocate and I endorse all people to – or encourage all people to start thinking about. Like there is no shame in opening up to people and talking about your problems. Mm. Um, and some of the, the bigger personalities in our friendship group, some of the louder personalities, the extroverts – it's a bit like they're finally starting to creep out of the woodwork and they're starting to talk about their problems. Um, and I'm really proud of that. And I'm really proud of a couple of friends as well that I've been mentoring personally that are now happy to share some of their experiences with, you know, the wider group um, in our circle. Um, and yeah, it's tough because for me, I really, I felt like it wasn't so long ago that um, a lot of people in my age demographic just weren't speaking to each other. Mm-hmm. Um and the thing about we'll talk we'll talk about the AFL, but I think there's been a concerted, um, measured, um, significant effort from the AFL, probably you know in just in recent times where they have started to really put this on the agenda. I don't want to like blame anyone or criticise anyone because we're just trying to get things off our chest here. But there was a period of time where I just didn't think they were doing enough, and for the vehicle that they are and the you know the promotional channels that they've got to deliver messages to the community. It used to piss me off, but I really think they've started to to take it upon themselves to you know try and champion the message. Do you think during your career there was enough support, there were enough services for players at the time, or do you think there's been a, a significant spike just recently? Um, I think it's a probably on a club by club basis. Um, yeah. Look, I think the the noises that the AFL making at the moment, which you're probably referring to, is. Um, you know, the hiring of a proper well-being committee within the AFL yep. industry. And, you know, it's yet to be seen exactly the impact that they're going to have. But I think it has to start there. It has to be an industry policy um, design thing that is going to be implemented across the board. And that's the only way we're going to see significant improvement um, across the whole industry. Now, with regards to the Western Bulldogs, I was extraordinarily lucky to have a resource like, like Lisa Stevens, who um, is my psychologist even till this day. And she has been enormously supportive of me and also all the players and staff at the Western Bulldogs. And I think our proximity to her and our ability to have someone readily available is a massive part of players being able to be open and honest and her being able to sort of see the changes in our own persona and all that sort of stuff makes it much, much, much easier. Now, within society, that's a massive 
challenge because trying to find the right resource can be challenging. It can be a difficult um, sort of situation where you go through a few different psychologists or psychiatrists, doctor sends you one way. And I, I have great, great sympathy for that. Um, it certainly makes the, the, whole, um, the whole system have some issues, I think, that they need to ultimately look at in the future. Looking to your own career, um, you were a number one draft pick. Did you feel additional pressure knowing that you were the number one of your year? Like the guys who are in your, your class, if you will. Your look, cohort. Your cohort, you know, looking at you going, he's the number one. You know, did you, do you feel any extra pressure at that time? Um, oh, it certainly felt a lot of pressure. Um, whether, whether that's tangible in terms of the, the, the comparison between you or your cohort is, is uh, it's still up in the air, I suppose. Yeah. Yet I would say that, you know, since I've been removed, it is so very obvious mm. that number one draft picks get so much more pressure. I, I don't think it's an yeah. argument within the industry. Um, and, and the remarkable thing that it's it, the difference between one and two is, again, it's an exorbitant difference in terms of be, the yeah, attention it they get. It means nothing, yeah. Now, there's a few reasons for that. I think the, the catchy phrase number one and, you know, the catchy phrase million dollar man or the catchy phrase big recruit, whatever yeah, it is, yeah, it yeah, creates yeah. a really easy, um, mm. an easy target or an easy mention within the, the way that the media outlets work today. Yeah, correct. Um, but certainly, I think, you know, we need to understand that, you know, footballers in general, draft, e pick, draft picks in general, whoever they are, Number one picks in general. Mm. They're just young kids. Oh, yeah. In the biggest transitional period of their lives, we're going from b- coddled babies from school to men growing up in the spotlight under the scrutiny where, you know, when all of us grew up, we're allowed to make mistakes and forget about it. Yeah. These guys are living in permanent society where everything they do is being judged, written about, and ultimately thrown back in their face at a later date. So I think our general care for these people needs to improve. I, I totally agree. And look, oh, I've got to put my hand up. I'm culpable. Like, yes. What, you know, there are a few Melbourne players, I'm a passionate Melbourne fan, a few Melbourne players that I've probably been... Jack Watts. Yeah, I've, I've been too harsh on over the journey. And you make a really, really good point there that we can get away with a lot. Like, I've, I've made many a mistake. Yeah. I'm pretty sure, Rob, you've made a few mistakes. Plenty. Along the way. Probably um, made some this morning and I'll probably make one on the way home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but the reality is, you're right, we're not going to be criticised for some of the little uh, boo-boos that may, we make, whereas yeah. it gets absolutely magnified in the public eye if you're a footballer. It's extremely harsh. When you boil it down, like you said there, 18, 19-year-old, pick one or pick two, whatever, top 10 pick, um, the money that the money factor comes into play as well, uh, which kind of annoys me at times. I'm not a I'm not a, a big fan of that the way that people use the money thing as a factor, but the reality is, I guess it's a ruthless caper. Uh, people and fans feel like they have an a, have an opinion, having a right to, right to an opinion, but what they probably don't have a right to is to hang people out to, out, out to dry. Um, you know, derogatory terms used to describe players, all those types of things. We're all guilty of it. We're all part of the problem. So how do you stop that? How do you stop social media uh, or how do you stop fans from acting the way they do on social media when it's completely deregulated? Well, you can't. And, and that's, that's part of it. Look, I think, I think with people who have a responsibility to report the news and report sport and the passion that's you know, in the industry, particularly within the AFL, is enormous. But there is a difference between criticising the player and criticising the person. And, you know, there have been concerted efforts, whether that be against coaches, Jack's a really good example, where media outlets have blatantly gone after him over and over and over again and basically tried to beat him down, which with no real reason why. Now, just because he's number one or I was number one or whatever, there is a line between this guy is not living up to his expectation and this guy is a failure and he's a detriment to his club. And there's, there's a clear line for me there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I would never criticise um, media outlets for reporting that or their opinion, but when it becomes a concerted effort to continuously report on it for no apparent reason, it seems irresponsible to me. Yeah, no, fair play. Uh, should we go to the grand final, Croft? Um, yeah, I got one, one, one more question before we get to get to the granny. Uh, obviously, start at the Giants, which was they're in their formative years at the time. They were still trying to figure things out. A lot of players came in, a lot of players came out. Tell me about your transition from the Giants, this new little club that spawned out of nowhere, to one of the old Victorian clubs in the Western Bulldogs. What was that transition like? Going from, I'll basically say it, to a real football club, mm. one that everyone really knows. What was that you know move like? 
Yeah, well, certainly not critical of the Giants at all. I mean, they, they were, again, formative years. Um, yeah. They were building the machine around us yeah. as we was going along. Mm. I mean, when I first got there, I was training in the athletic centre underground mm. um, down the road in, in Sydney Olympic Park. And by the end of Christmas, um, we moved up to their new beautiful facilities up there at Tom Mills Oval. I think it was a cold at the time. So, um, look, there was some challenges they were facing um, logistically, but no doubt there was a stark, stark contrast. Now, if you just consider the, um, the, the makeup of their list at the time, mm. 20, 25 first-round picks to an actual old, regulated, hierarchical yeah. club that yeah. had, you know, Bob Murphy, Dale Morris, guys who were 35 years old, yeah. or <laughs> probably 33 at the time, I shouldn't say that shot. Sorry, Bob. Um, <laughs> all the way Poor down to, um, yeah. to Marcus bunton Pally, a future yeah. captain of the club mm. at the time. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a natural order of progression. Yeah. And I think that was a really... Um, important distinction for me to make is that yeah. good is that good as a young player knowing there's hierarchy or when you're amongst I guess you know amongst your cohort everyone's young D- did you enjoy that more no no I think um, I think I enjoyed the hierarchy more and there's a there's a couple of reasons why the first would be that there is a natural maturation process that happens in life like when you're 20 you don't know what you're doing and when you're, I'm 24 in five years I'm going to say I don't know what I'm doing I'm 30 and I still don't know what exactly. I'm doing exactly. That's Bob no was idea. 37 <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I've just, got a bit of time then. <laughs> yeah. But the fact that there are adults in the group is really, really important. Yeah. Now, there was a few of the Giants, but generally there was a huge flat mm. structure at the bottom where everyone was the same age. And when you have the natural progression and the natural order of things, you get a clear rung that you need to climb, yeah. which I think is really healthy because it yeah. gives you a natural competitiveness. But it's like as soon as you get your, you get too big for yourself or you get out of hand, Some, someone who's a bit older goes, pipe down, mate. Yes. Just, you know. Important. Do, do your time. I like that. Yeah. That, that. That's a good little reference point because later on when we wrap up, we've got a, a – it's a weird little segment that you've created. Yeah, I, I, I like to bring some strange segments to the table on this on this podcast. Anyway, I've got one for you. Crowd. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll save it for the end. It's, it's odd. We'll get to it. Um, so Mike Shane, just on Mike, favourite grand final was uh, 2016. I'll never forget watching that one. I was mm. at Collingwood at uh, the house – that I used to live in, a share house with a couple of mates, and we had about 20 people over, and uh, every single person was going for the doggies. I don't think one person was supporting the Swannies. Yeah. And half of my family go for Sydney, all my cousins and relatives, but I thought, nah, stuff you. <laughs> I'm, on the, I'm on the doggies bandwagon. I, Everyone in Victoria was. I actually, I enjoyed the prelim more. That was, oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's still to date amongst a lot of friends of mine, the best game of AFL I've ever just sat and watched on TV. That day was one of my friend's birthdays, who's a classic old rock and roller, long hair, doesn't watch footy. So I'm at a house <laughs> with a bunch of n- n- non-AFL fans. And I'm like, guys, I want to watch the prelim. I put it on. Start of the game. It's me, me sitting there by myself on the couch by the last quarter. The entire party's in there watching. All these blokes are all playing rock bands, hanging out at Cherry Bar, being like, who are these guys? And who I'm do like, you hang out with? <laughs> interesting people. <laughs> interesting people. Seriously. Uh, but I... You know, like you know, a game has that level of energy. That's basically it was raiding out of the TV. That people who, you know, they're from Melbourne, they watch a bit of footy. There were but more that, doggies it, fans and Giants fans in the stadium too. It, yeah, it was electric. That that obviously would have helped knowing that you had that support up there. Yeah, it was remarkable. I mean, we we came out so ten minutes before the bounce, and it was a, it was a strange um, lead up for some reason that we sort of got let out a bit late and we sort of rushed through it a bit because of the national anthem. And it's yeah, a, yeah. The finals um, situation pregame is really different. But I remember running out. First thing I thought was, wow, it's hot. It yeah. was so hot. It was like 25, 26 degrees, blaring oh, sunlight. Yeah, when yeah, I was running, yeah. I was like, oh, this is not good. I'm tired already. <laughs> and the second thing I thought was like, they're, they're booing. They're yeah. booing the Giants yeah. as they're running out in their home stadium. Now, regardless if the Giants were two years in, five years in, at a home prelim, weird. that is not ideal. <laughs> No, and after having played West Coast over there and been absolutely abused, yes. it was a really nice, refreshing <laughs> change of pace to go up and, and play a away final with that sort of crowd. Don't forget, you would mm. have been stoked to get one over the former team as well. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah? It, was, um, yeah, it was a tough day. I'd actually, funnily enough, I can't remember. I'm not sure if everyone remembers, but I came out in the media and I'd done a play- piece with Emma Quayle, who was a, a good friend of mine yep, from back in the day, and yeah, yeah. Um, I'd sort of said in there, look, like I thought everyone knew I had a shoulder injury at this time, but yeah. I'd come out and so I said, look, I've been dealing with his shoulder and blah, blah, blah. It's been, you know, keep doing it every week. Had it since 2014, my first season at the Giants. Jared yeah. Harbour did it to me, I think, of yeah. all people. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, Jared. And, um, Shout out. And, and that week, I just started getting this sense that they were all going to come after me because <laughs> of my shoulder. 
Because someone keeps going, you shouldn't have said that. I was like, what do you mean, mate? I've had yeah. it strapped so, all year. Yeah. I've done it five times. Like, yeah. Surely people know it's sore. And then first, like, first time I get on the ground, mummy's just bashing it. Oh. Oh. Should have strapped the opposite shoulder. Well, he was bashing it in the wrong spot anyway. I was like, he could have bashed any shoulder yeah. and it would have hurt just as much. So yeah, that made the day pretty long. Uh, that that is a good pick out, Rob. We can't yeah. forget that prelim. I can't. I yeah. I I can't gloss over that. Next week, obviously, the big dance. Um, talk me through the lead up to a grand final sitting in the rooms you know no 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 no, no. the parade the parade okay <laughs> is the parade fun is the parade good <laughs> yeah <laughs> or is it like oh this is fucking weird <laughs> well it's very strange right so as you said the whole victoria probably the whole of australia was behind us yes right? so there was there was 180,000 people at the parade yeah 180,000 people is a lot of people that's a lot of people that's insane yeah and even though there's that many people you drive along you can still hear people abusing you <laughs> <laughs> And you've got nowhere to go because yeah. you're sitting in a car oh, yeah. just sort of bolted into a Hilux looking around like, oh, I'm not going to be awkward here. I'm just going to talk to the guy <laughs> yeah, next to me. Yeah. And everyone's just like, you're not worth a million bucks or something oh. like that. And I'm like, well, what do you want me to say back to you, mate? I'm oh. stuck in a car. Neither are you, buddy. <laughs> all, those, all those dickheads I was talking about. Who were you in a car with? I think I was with Tori Dixon and his kid Okay, um, okay. with Riley. So yeah. I think. Yeah. I may have forgotten that, but yeah. I think that's right. <laughs> it, the, the parade itself is quite a strange phenomenon. I've never been. No, but neither, no, neither, have, neither have I. Neither have I. I go for Melbourne. <laughs> of course I've never been. <laughs> of course I've never been. But yeah. do, do you, you know what I mean? Mm. Like, I think if other sporting codes, those ones from overseas, look at it and they go, this is a bit odd. It's I know it's they, strange. They, they do it in other sports, but it's usually the other way around. Place, you yeah. do the parade when you win and then you do it in the home I think, city. I think it plays to a couple of things. I think it plays to how big AFL is in Victoria. Yes. Like, that is... and. The second part is that the game's played in the same city every yeah. year. So that's that's the reason, I think, mm. that it makes sense. True. Uh, so the game itself, it's mm. a berserk game. Sydney, late in the second quarter, I was like, oh, they're going to run away with it here. I think mm. uh, Josh Kennedy had had like... Yeah, well, pro- I, think, I think he'd had 108 kick. touches to half time. Yeah. <laughs> Kicked two and had 20 or something, or 22. Yeah. I was like, yeah. Jesus, he, right. he, yeah. he was on fire. And I was like, oh, God, I think, I think you know, the doggies dash is done. But then... Third quarter, thrilling last quarter. Um, man, the drama, the energy in the stadium as well, even just hearing it um, through the TV and then speaking to a couple of doggy supporters after that say it's the best day of their mm. life, of mm. course, aside from having kids and things like that. Yeah, they just put that little proviso yeah. in there. <laughs> Always, always, yeah. yeah but uh, having you is the best day, yeah. Billy. Yeah. <laughs> um, Can't just remember their birthday, but they can remember the day <laughs> of the granny. <laughs> of course. Um, but, yeah, the... The day itself, again, similar thing. Lead up, the game, your moment, the goal, talk to us. Because it was magic. What a grand final. Yeah. Yeah, well, from, uh, so from memory, the foot, like, it's hard to remember everything. Um, I got a couple of kicks in the second quarter, I think. Um, kicked the goal from the boundary on the left, which I still, to this day, yeah. don't know. <laughs> don't know I mean, I've practised it a few times. <laughs> Did it still. go right to left or left to right? How did uh, it work? Oh, straight through the middle. Yeah. Straight through the middle? Oh, I kind of remember that one. The one it. it was like I marked it like on the point post. Yeah. And I swear to God, I couldn't see the goals, but I didn't have, I couldn't pass it. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, have a go. I'm my opposite. <laughs> and straight off the boot, I was like, it's going through for sure. So it was, that was, that was awesome. That was a good way to start the day. Yep. Um, but I think, so just before half time, I think the Swans got up a couple of goals and then we might've pinched a couple back. Mm. Yeah. But just before half time, I was in a ruck contest just on the top of the goal square and um, against, uh, it's not Nate Kerbis. What's the other guy's name? Um, Naismith. 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 Yeah. 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 Um, and my shoulder came out, and oh, so that he hurts. hit the tap straight down. Tommy should throw goal, put them up just before half time. So I was like, "Well, this is not ideal." Um, <laughs> got it restrapped, came back out, and actually felt pretty good. So you know, like within the room, we had so many personalities, but without without a doubt, we had so much belief within each other, mm. and we're probably the closest team I've ever seen. Like, as in close to your teammates, friends, um, care for each other. Yep. Um, and I think that's what held us in really good stead. But I ultimately believe we had you know, an enormous amount of belief that we were going to get over the line. I don't think we ever doubted we could beat Sydney. Mm. We'd had the medal over them for a little while. Um, and, yeah, it was sort of a crazy third quarter, three-quarter time. You can't hear anything anyway. So Bevo yeah. sort of trying to give you a speech about what to do. And, and ultimately, it just comes down to a battle of attrition and, and just the little things going your way. Um, you know, that ball that I picked up could have bounced another way. I would have missed it. Um, Stephen Mill knows all about that. Yeah, no. precisely. Like it's just it's it's so it's small that, that it's not necessarily the moments that change the score, but it's it's the moments that change the momentum yeah. in the game. Big time. Um, you know, it's 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 um, Woody taking out Hanbury. Like yeah. I mean, it was obviously uh, illegal. Yeah. yeah. But those moments 
really hurt Sydney. Mm. And, you know, ultimately these moments end up winning us a game. When, when we had Mike in the other day, he was talking about how these Bulldogs fans who, you know, have seen everything with this club, it nearly folded, you know, 20 years before, mm. you know, no success. And they basically say, I've died happy. Did you meet many of these, you know, proper Footscray people after the grand final? And what was, you know, what were the discussions like with them? Yeah, well, we're so lucky to have such a um, diverse fan base of the Bulldogs. I mean, you know, historically a working class part of Melbourne, mm. um, plenty of multiculturalism, but just a real passion for the sub of, uh, the club of the suburbs, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. Um, and again, underdogs almost exclusively Always. throughout their whole existence. Yeah. And I think the fact that we could get up that year and, and become, you know, basically break a 62-year drought, obviously so many years since we won a premiership, and really rewrite the story a little mm. bit of the club is so important to many people. And that's why there was so much support. But, you know, I still do get the, the odd occasion where I run into, you know, you know Dolores, the 80-year-old grandma, who comes up to me and says, oh, thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. I'm so glad I got to see that before I die. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, it seems comical, but it is one of the most humbling experiences yeah. that you could have provided a moment in someone's life that they will remember forever. Yeah. That's the beauty of sport. Mm. Yep, no, I totally That's agree. That's what I'm hoping to do with this podcast for a few people, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can give up on that because that's not going to happen. Just uh, team unity. I wanted to pick you up on that point before he does his weird segment we wrap up. But um, your run into the finals makes the whole thing even better because mm. in the last round you lose to Freo. You get Pumped. Sm- yeah, you get smashed. Yep. And then you go back over there. You have a week's break, of course, which helps yep. you guys because well, you had a lot really of injuries. 10 days, right? So we played Saturday night and then came up to Thursday, I think. You yeah. had a lot of injury problems, though, leading into that yep. West Coast game. So it gives you a bit of a reprieve so you can reset the, the button and go again. So when you, when you upset West Coast and pump them and then you come into a game against Hawthorne, the all-conquering Hawthorne, mm. who have won so many flags in the years previous... You beat them, and then you go up to GWS. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it. The AFL's, you know, pet because they've had to take so much time and care of them and try to prop them up and get them into a viable position. It all seems so set up for GWS yet again. Defy the odds. Then you come in against another great veteran or campaigner against Sydney. The actual finals series run and the fact that you get smashed in that last round against Freo makes the whole thing. Even better. Like, did you ever look back on that and go, wow, we came up against all this adversity in those four or five weeks and we came out the other side? For me personally, and I've said this on even the debrief for Melbourne podcast, mm. I didn't even think it was, I guess, humanly possible to be able to defy the odds the way you did. That's why for me, I think it is the greatest, say, finals, grand final run ever, mm. in my opinion, because of everything you faced. Yeah, well, I think we're the first team ever to win from seventh, if yep. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so that's so, a yeah. that's a pretty historic moment. Um, yeah. Look, I think th- the West Coast, oh, sorry, the last round of the year against Fremantle is a little overstated. Now, I only say that because it was Pab's last game. Yeah. So big day for the club. Oh, Got come, it. come on, don't understate. Was it Sandy two or just Pav? Uh, no, Sandy wasn't in Sandy's last game, but he came back to play that that's game. That's right. So I think that's he played, right. Sandy played one more year. Right? Yeah. So um, you did a Carlton. And in Melbourne, you tanked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're like, you're like, boys, it's Pav's last game. He's a legend. Everyone yeah. was like, yeah, no, nah, Pav's a legend. Yeah, do yeah. it for Pav. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's what we did. Is <laughs> that what Bevo put on the whiteboard? Yeah, do Is it for Pav. Like, lose, but just not by too much. No. <laughs> by the contrary, I think, first and foremost, they were up and about that yeah. day. Yeah. And yeah. they play that ground particularly well. That mm. is a completely different beast. The main stadium is remarkable. No, yeah. it's not there anymore, but remarkable. Mm. Um, the other thing was that we had five guys miss that game. So I think, if my memory serves me correct, Libertoro, uh, McRae, mm. Eastern Wood, if he played, he played underdone. And there was two others that came back in for the first final. So we're talking about a serious injection of seriously good players yeah. um, 10 days later. Yeah. And, you know, talk about all the hurdles we got over. Those first two quarters against West Coast in the first final were the most important because you've never seen a team torched a team as good as West Coast, who were really the hottest team in the comp leading into the finals, mm. and also in their home pitch with a really adverse crowd, silence them all. And that adverse it, is polite, by the way. Yes, yeah. very polite. Um, but that that those those two quarters just created an inertia that couldn't be stopped. Now you know we could have played poorly the first quarter, and then suddenly that momentum isn't created, and who knows what happens. Yeah. But you know, ultimately, I don't think anyone was really concerned that we we're going to lose any game. Um, at one time but to win all four obviously was quite remarkable oh, I just I think it's incredible yeah and I, mean, I was at the prelim against West Coast for the days yeah and uh, the noise over there is phenomenal it's yeah. like nothing I've ever experienced and I've been to a World Cup with this bozo yeah. over in Russia 
Um, I've been to Liverpool games and Premier League games, um, and I almost think that's the yeah. loudest I've ever heard of stadium. Yeah, West Coast know. fans are crazy. Yeah, nuts. they are. Now we're going to wrap up with a real, real highbrow. I'm nervous. Bit is of this is here. this Nuffy? Um, yeah. Well, we do a footy podcast. We're Nuffy, so that's yeah. just, that's just what we are. I've had to uh, accept so that fate with you. So this is an idea that I thought of last night. On the couch, oh, watching good. the football. Heaps of time to think it over. Uh, when, when, <laughs> when, when, when I found out you, you, you were likely to be coming in, I this was is like, going to be awful. I was like, I was like, I need to think of something fun, no. something stupid, to end. So and you texted me it. I, I, I texted to you, and you said that's going to be that's either really good or awful. And I said, oh, I'm hopefully it's good. There's no in between. Okay, so the game because you played for the Bulldogs, the game's called Big Dog or Little Puppy. <laughs> I'm going to name former former teammates of yours, and you just going to tell puppy. me if their their general behaviour around the club represented that of a big dog or of a little puppy. I'm not saying they as players; everyone is a big dog on the field in their in their moments, yeah. but just as them as how they behave. So you could have chosen like breeds. Yeah, breeds. Breeds, okay. breeds. Okay. Breeds might have been the guy. okay. Do you uh, know a lot of dog breeds? Enough. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Bull- so bulldog or chihuahua. Yeah. There we go. Okay, bulldog or chihuahua. Okay. okay. Uh, Liam Pickin, bulldog or chihuahua. Uh, Oh, that's actually a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Very reserved, yeah, but cracking person, like yeah. super smart. So yeah, we'll call him a bulldog. Okay, he's it's a bulldog. A, it's hard to say. He's just very quiet. Uh, he's a quiet bulldog. Uh, Shane Biggs, bulldog or oh, chihuahua? Bulldog. Absolute Crazy. bulldog. Toby Green, um, oh, p- bulldog. Bulldog, obviously. definitely bulldog. Dale Morris, uh, chihuahua. chihuahua. No, obviously not. How does, to- <laughs> how does Toby? How does Toby Green get in there? Because he played with the, yeah, Giants the Giants with him. With him. I know that. Yeah. Aren't we oh, keeping it to Bulldogs? I just wanted to throw one one guy in there. Okay. Well, uh, every, every, Toby Green might be the most asked about player I've ever been asked about. Honestly. Yeah. Everyone's know. He's, yeah. a good, he's actually a good fella. Yeah. Would you believe? Yeah, good no, fella, I'm cracking like, footballer. Yeah. Uh, crazy on the field. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. White line fever. Yep. Uh, Jason Johannesson. Uh, neither. Neither. <laughs> neither. <laughs> <laughs> what is he? A, a poodle? Poodle yeah, with the hair yeah, all done yeah, up? Yeah, maybe, there you go. Maybe. Okay. Okay. Uh, Caleb Daniel. Can't up go to <laughs> Poor Caleb. Uh, and Tom Libertore. Uh, Bulldog. Okay, sure. there we but go. But come on, Caleb, Caleb's got the heart the size of a lion. All right, listeners, oh, no viewers, doubt. if you liked that uh, that segment, I'll bring it back next time we have a former Bulldog player. <laughs> no no one liked it. <laughs> no one liked it. I can it. categorically tell you right now. I can hear the unlike buttons it's being just clicked such at the a moment. Broad question, isn't <laughs> it? Such a broad question. Are they big or are they small? <laughs> like, did, what does that mean? Did, did you enjoy that? <laughs> It was very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> so it was shit out. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Um, who was the biggest personality at the Bulldogs? Uh, oh, at any one time it would have changed. Clay Smith was pretty big. Yep. Um, yeah, Shane yeah, Biggs, yeah. definitely. Um, depends what you mean by personality. You know, the Bonts, he's got a yeah. pretty big personality. Yeah. Um, but we were we were absolutely um, lucky to have such a diverse range of characters. Yeah. Yeah. It was one of the most interesting times of my life. The most interesting <laughs> group of people, but all meshed together mm. extraordinarily well. Bevo's a legend, isn't he, too? Yeah, he's done wonders for our footy club. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it shows really, really clearly the um, the impact of someone who's so emotionally positive getting yeah. into a club and really turning the fortunes around quickly. Now, yeah. to sustain that for two years is very difficult. You see it consistently when a new coach comes in, you get a quick spark and it sort of peters off. Yeah. But, you know, he had two years of serious building and now they're looking like they're going to be up there again. So he's done a very good job. I've got one last one. Uh, Easton Wood, obviously... Got handed the the skipper role after Bob went down early in the season. Um, what was his leadership like through that 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 you know the finals campaign? Because he would have been immense. Yeah, it was really like look, Woody has always been um, a really significant leader, both in being a consummate professional and also a significant contributor on the field. And I think those were his two strengths. Um, he really really set the example both as a player and as a player around the club, which yeah. is super important for a young group. Um, and I think he's done a terrific. Um, terrific job he's, he's a heart, heart of gold and, and one of my best mates so um, look it'll be really interesting seeing Bont take over the reins but I don't mm. think anyone's going to be unhappy with him at the at the helm no I love it Doggies fans will enjoy that mate that was refreshing um, absolutely love it and appreciate your honesty of course and uh, Croft that was just playing weird mate I don't know what that last segment was it was good fun Thanks yeah. for coming in, Tom. Oh, might be a couple it of years before I come back and do that <laughs> second again. It's, a, it's only our second podcast, so there's a bit of fine tuning and tweaking that needs to happen. <laughs> yeah, so. perhaps like a bit of like a, a, a group meeting beforehand to discuss possible <laughs> yeah. scenarios. We'll do a workshop. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we didn't really do much prep. You yeah. can tell. I can't afford an assistant producer, so oh, well, <laughs> it is what it is. Thanks for that, Tom. No, thanks for having me, boys. What a great chat! That's one of the better interviews I think we've ever done. 
Croft. Yeah, um, the look on Tom's face when I brought that terrible segment to the table was sheer disgust. Oh. Uh, but I think he enjoyed it. And hopefully we get him back again one day. He made it fun. He made it fun. He changed it slightly. He did. He made it better, let's be honest. Uh, but good that he played. Had some really interesting points to make about mental health, which is great. Mm. And it's very pertinent at the moment. Yes. Because people are going to be in lockdown or in their own homes and a lot of people are going to miss out on some of those things that they love in their life they go out and do mm-hmm. like going to the cinemas a restaurant a pub yes. uh, just enjoying all those things that we probably take for granted so we've got a newfound sense of perspective so yeah. for, so for Tom to bring all that stuff up mm. um, and just speak to it with such brevity and and, and knowledge um, having gone through it firsthand yeah um, Good I, I can't speak more highly enough of him. Yeah, no, I'm I'm very very impressed by the young man. So, so I, ho- I, I hope glad, glad we got him in, and I just hope there are very a lot of thankful to uh, all involved. I just hope there are a lot of great takeaways for people. Exactly from what exactly. he was saying. Cheers, Glenn, for that. Yes, thank you, Glenn. Uh, we will wrap up now. We don't know what our situation means right now. No, we're working through it. Yes. Um, I'm not particularly sure we'll be in this studio by the next time we do a podcast. Yeah, we might not be here. We could be somewhere else. We could be in separate locations. But the point is the show is going to keep going. Uh, We want to continue to bring our listeners and viewers on YouTube. Uh, We want to continue to bring you content. This is going to be a pretty dark time for all of us and a lot of people are going to be sitting at home bored. So we want to continue to bring content. Um, Unfortunately, we probably won't be able to get people into our studio space anymore but the people who we have been speaking to who would like to join us on our show we're going to try and bring them in remotely somehow that's the idea um so we'll still be able to bring you good interviews with former you know champions or just icons of the game or whoever it may be people in the afl landscape who knows maybe we might even get a current play because they're sitting at home on the couch and have nothing to do but the point is we're going to continue to Get, get content out there. Obviously, we won't be talking about weekly game, but it'll be about stuff that happened in the past and we can all get around and enjoy a bit of uh, bit of reminiscing together. Yeah, and I think for us, we just hope that whatever we do and whoever we speak to, mm. we, we just bring a little bit of joy to your life and what is yeah. going to be a really tough time for everyone. And yes. I just want to make mention of all those people last night and all the people over the last couple of weeks that have effectively lost their jobs and yes. their livelihood. Um it's it's really sad, man. It's it's tough to kind of sum it up in words at the moment and no doubt in the next week and in the coming months mm. other things are going to happen that are going to devastate us and everyone in our society. So mm. the one thing I'll say is listen to the government. Yeah. Uh, listen to the experts. Listen to all the authorities. Listen to the people that understand exactly what is happening around mm. us and how we should protect ourselves, yeah. protect our families and stay safe. Um, and just take care of each other and do what you can, like Tom Boyd was saying before, mm. do what you can to make yourself feel a little bit better. Definitely. And with supporting the community, um, by now listening to this show, um, you'll know that many, obviously, restaurants and cafes are all closed. A lot of these places are still open for takeaway. If you are looking to do takeaway and you are able to leave the house to drive down, Call these places up and go pick it up or see if they offer their own delivery service because you're going to actually be putting your money back into the community. Yeah. You're not giving money to Uber Eats or Menu Log or Deliveroo or whoever else. You can actually put it back into these businesses. Well, they'll take all the money. They're not going to get a small percentage. So, you, look, that might not be possible uh, depending on the circumstance, but actually give the restaurant a call yeah. rather than just getting on your app because it means that these people who are actually really struggling, not some big conglomerate, uh, we'll get the money. So try and actually do that if you can, people. Yeah, well said, Croft. I like that. We'll wrap up. Uh, what's our shout out again, mate? Subscribe on. Yeah, subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find us there. And if you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, share us, like us, get the voice around, spread the love. We're all in this together. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll be back next week, hopefully with another good interview. We'll be back when we're back. Take care, be safe. And uh, yeah, we might see you in a week or so. Yep, Dons are undefeated.